Welcome to the New Trust Economy, where your hosts, Blockchain 101 author and founder of Rise Housing, Monica Profit, and Inc. innovation columnist and brand casting strategist, Tracy Hazard, explore all things blockchain, ICO ventures, and cryptocurrency. Each week, they explore businesses, applications, and venture built on blockchain or cryptocurrency and address issues like women and diversity in tech, trust and distrust, and the economics of access and value. We would like to remind our listeners that investing in disruptive tech, ICOs, and cryptocurrency is speculative in nature and involves substantial risk of loss. We encourage you to invest carefully and do your due diligence first. Now, here's today's host, Monica Profit. Hi, and welcome to the New Trust Economy. This is Monica Profit, and I'm here with Dan Hannum of Hannum Capital Management. Hey, Dan, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, Monica. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure. So I, I want to talk a little bit about your background here as the founder and not CEO, but CIO of Hannum Capital Management. I mean, to have a venture capital management firm just sounds like such a stuffy old white guy thing to do. And you really, I mean, so far, I don't know you that well, but you don't seem like a very stuffy old white guy. So, you know, can you tell me a little bit about how on earth you got into this? Yeah. Yeah. White guy, definitely stuffy, hopefully not. Um, yeah, you know, my background is largely in traditional finance. I went to the University of South Carolina uh, from undergrad and then also my MBA. And then really had an idea of getting in traditional finance, being a stockbroker, just getting in like investment banking. Ended up going from South Carolina up to New York and started working at Goldman Sachs. Went from Goldman Sachs to Morgan Stanley. And that was kind of like the entry into investment banking, into traditional finance. Um, and then once you kind of get into the industry, I think people then start kind of opening their eyes into, you know, there's a lot that you can do within investment banking or finance. Um, So I really try to narrow in of of where can I have the most impact or, or, you know, where can I add the most value and and what can I, you know, get the most value from. And I really just kept gravitating towards venture and and just seeing these amazing entrepreneurs from, you know, all over the world that had these amazing ideas and, you know, really just lacked funding or support uh, to go chase their, their dreams. Um, and, you know, just got connected with um, some really amazing uh, VCs who, um, you know, were willing to let a young kid kind of tag along and, and you know, uh, be a fly on the wall and see how it works. So that's kind of how the uh, the migration from like traditional finance into venture went. And, you know, it's been yeah. exciting. That is crazy. I mean, that's like kind of leap after leap after leap. So I want to back up a little bit because <laughs> the first leap I hear is like you went to the University of South Carolina. Um, and I, I don't nothing against South Carolina at all, but I'm not that's not like the school that I've heard a lot about, right? I also went to a school that not people, people haven't heard a whole lot about, like Evergreen State College, like, ah, you even have the word state college in there, you know? Yeah. So like, <laughs> the pedigree is not really a part of it. So, um, and I don't mean to just bulk, you know, just bulk, bunch you in with my um, lack of pedigree, but it does sound like you may um, have the same um, different sort of alternative background that makes it so, I mean, I, I didn't even know that Goldman Sachs hired people that didn't have an Ivy League degree. <laughs> so, okay, first of all, how did you, you know, I, I understand like going to school for what you're passionate about, what you know about, what you like, any, any school, that's totally, you know, that's kind of fair game. But like, how did you end up thinking, even thinking to yourself, oh, I'm going to go and, and get into Wall Street. Like, oh yeah, I'm going to take this. I mean, I think we all know the pedigree matters. So did, how did you overcome like the, the intimidating part of it, or did you just end up with the right connections that you felt like that opened up the world to you? Because this really is a, Wall Street's not exactly an open door policy. <laughs> so can you tell me a little bit about how you, how you made that leap internally and externally? Sure, sure. So I'm, I'm a big proponent of sharing success and also failure. So to backtrack a little bit, I actually had the, the privilege and honor of being expelled from my high school. <laughs> you know, that started, you know, the, the fun path of, you know, not caring about credentials and not really caring about rules. So that's kind of like what sparked the, you know, I don't really care attitude. Um, but that turned into, you know, when it was time to go look at colleges, you know, some of the, the Ivy League ones were just, you know, off the table. And that's, you know, due to my <laughs> own actions and my own, you know, childish stupidity that, you know, has been, you know, had to go through it to be, you know, the man I am today. But anyway, so that kind of eliminated a lot of the opportunities or, you know, uh, potential uh, schools that I could go to. So actually, before I went to the University of South Carolina, I went to a really small school called Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Um, so even tinier, so like <laughs> in the middle of nowhere in the middle of Pennsylvania, they were the only ones that were like, cool, we'll give you a shot. It's probably because I was out of state and I was paying three times as much as the people that were in state. So they were like, oh, cool. We'll, you know, we'll let this, you know, we'll, we'll let this guy in and see if he has a, uh, you know, um, 
has uh, the ability to go learn. So we'll take a something. misfit as long as he pays three times as much as our local good old boys, right? <laughs> oh, it's pretty much like I think out of state was like I don't know twenty grand a year, and like in state was like four or something. So oh, wow. I think they were they were willing to give a couple people from out of state uh, an opportunity. The good thing is I had some friends from school from high school that were going there, so like that transition was easy. Um, but anyway, so was there, my sister, uh, has been in venture for quite some time and was kind of just early on in her career when I was still in college. Um, and I originally actually went to college for, uh, criminal justice, <laughs> Whoa. I had no idea I even wanted, well, I knew I was like, I was good at numbers. I was good at math, but I didn't really like think of like investment banking or finance or wall street. Anyways, she, you know, was building her career and, and you know, being, uh, you know, having some good success early on and opened up a lot of doors and a lot of opportunities. So I went to visit her in New York uh, when I was still in school. She, you know, kind of lined up like a nice little like uh, roadmap for like the week of, you know, we're going to met with these five or six companies that are all hiring for interns, yada, yada, yada. So she was really instrumental in, you know, helping me get my foot in the door. And then, you know, for me, I always knew once I got my foot in the door that, you know, I would outwork, you know, you know, work longer, work harder, do what I need to do to, to kind of win. So as you, you know, as you mentioned, it's definitely like a credentialized or a pedigree world. But I think that the good thing is if, if you have the ability to break into that world, sometimes that credential or that pedigree is actually a detriment, whether it's with work ethic or whether it's with, you know, hustle or grind. And I think that was, you know, my advantage was I was willing to, you know, spend 15, 20 hours at the office, do whatever I needed to do where, you know, some of the other guys that were in uh, my internship class, you know, were you know nine to five as soon as you know nine o'clock happened there in the door five o'clock happened there out and you know that's yep. you know that's obviously something that I'm looking to build you know for myself and my family is to have the ability to you know make sure that my kids have opportunities and that type of stuff but I guess that was the difference is you know I was a little hungrier hungrier and, and I had um, you know I had some help getting my foot in the door and, and once I got that foot in the door I knew that I would be able to you know go make a couple things happen so that's uh, hopefully a little bit of a, a background and, and kind of trajectory of, of how I got in. Yeah. Where was your first internship and what was it like? Like, do you remember what it was like when you showed up on that first day and you were like, okay, I'm, I'm swimming in the deep end now. And, uh, like, do you remember what it was like when you first got that? Kind of. Yeah. So I think for better or worse, I've always had a little bit of a cockiness or confidence to me. So as much as like the companies were looking at, you know, the credentials and the resumes, I, I wasn't, you know, it was just line them up and I'll knock them down. Same thing with sports, same things with, you know, whatever I do in life. So for me, it wasn't like, oh, I'm, I'm swimming in the big leagues. You're like, I'm, you know, stepping into something that I don't feel comfortable with. It was, you know, wow, I have an opportunity to go show that like kids that didn't go to Harvard and Yale and Princeton, you know, have value. Um, yeah. So that was amazing. And, and the first internship was actually at Goldman. So that was oh, super wow. helpful because it allowed me to get my foot in the door first internship really didn't do much um, other than, you know, just get a lot of your credentials. So in order to be efficient in investment banking, you have to go through, you know, either series, which is like a series seven or 63 or 65. Then you kind of get into like your CPA or, or, you know, CFP or all these types of like certifications or verifications. So in order to actually like get kind of a, you know, quote unquote on the floor with a Goldman or a Morgan Stanley, you need to actually get, go and get um, like certified or sponsored. And I think that's something that I didn't realize at the time either is you can't go and just take a series seven. You actually have to have <laughs> right. a firm to no, go say like they're part of our club, which, you know, that's another subject of the story that I think should be changed. But anyway, so that was really the first internship is we sat in a room for 12 hours a day and just studied, you know, went through series seven books, went through pamphlets, went through questionnaires, went through stuff. And, and that was just an internship. So it was really, I don't know when college is, you know, June, July, August, maybe two or three months. So it was just like, go study, go learn, get credentials, you know, if you're good. And if you made enough connections, like we'll, we'll probably invite you back to, to start. And, you know, like I said, that was, that was all I was asking for is, you know, give me an opportunity. And, you know, I went into the internship, you know, placed better than a lot of the other people in my class, uh, as far as like getting uh, the, our scores that we got, and then was invited back to, to start. So that was kind of uh, the, the nice thing is I went back to school for senior year and kind of was able to have something lined up and and really kind of chase uh, my passion. And, and that was really, you know, investing in, in investment banking and, and finance at the time. And, you know, as we discussed that kind of opened up doors into venture and, and other things, but, but that was kind of the, the experience with the internship and, and really um, kind of what we spent doing. And then, you know, once we got the full-time role, then you kind of started climbing up the, the corporate ladder a little bit. So did you have a similar sort of uh, internship first foray into venture as well? Or what was your first kind of venture connection and experience like? Who was it with? 
Yeah, it was actually with blockchain capital. So that's okay. that's kind of like the, the transition from traditional finance into crypto. Um, and, and it really started off as more of like an, an outside analyst role than like a full time hire. So it's just I was I was at Morgan Stanley in about 2015 and really got very fascinated with, with Bitcoin and blockchain. I had invested it back in 2013 um, when I was still in school, but didn't really like grasp like what I was investing in. Um, so really okay. 2015 came back around, got, you know, in New York, there was a big circle of people that were getting really interested in crypto, having meetups, having, you know, connections. So I really just started spending a ton of like my nights and my weekends on, on crypto and kind of, you know, thought back and was like, what do I want out of my life? And, you know, how can I go get that? And, you know, there is one path, which is, you know, sit at Goldman or Morgan or another investment bank for 40, 50 years and hope you become partner. And that's a very, you know, very cushioned life, you know, very productive life. And, you know, not, you know, just not the path that I wanted. Um, and I just really wanted to go follow my passion. And that was crypto. And, you know, at the time there, there wasn't the same infrastructure as there, there is today. Um, so it was, it was definitely a little bit of a risk, but I guess the way I looked at it is that was I had, you know, a, a decent school, um, had a decent internship, you know, had decent, uh, you know, uh, 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 items on my resume. So I felt comfortable that I could go take a risk, follow my passion into crypto. And if it didn't work out, you know, I could always go back and get a job at a Goldman, a Morgan Stanley, a TD Ameritrade, whoever. Um, yeah. So that's kind of the foray. Right? Got, got introduced to a few people that were starting a, a couple funds. Um, they all kind of were just trying to figure out a ton of different stuff. It was just such a new thing at the time that they just need people that were like, hey, here's like a topic. Go research this and, and get us everything that you can on this and then bring it back to us so that we can you know, figure that out. So I think one of the first things that I do is like figure out like wallet management. So like, <laughs> hot, like hot, hot storage, cold storage, you know, hardware wallets, paper wallets. And Obviously, you know, the, the custody and ecosystem in crypto has evolved over the last five years. But essentially, that was kind of the first foray was chase my passion into crypto, find people that were willing to pay me to go, you know, research what I love doing. And then that kind of just, ex you know, expanded, you know, once, once you, you know, you do 20 or 30, uh, you know, analyst type letters to go, hey, you should go meet with, you know, Joe, who is, you know, a junior associate at, at whatever. Um, so it kind of just builds up and you earn trust and you earn, you know, a little bit. Uh, uh, so did you start bit, out uh, with an internship in venture or were you hired to be an external out analyst in venture at the time? The analyst role. So no internship. It wasn't like an internship or like an EIR. It wasn't even like really official at the time. Like yeah. it was just like, hey, like we'll pay you whatever, 50 bucks an hour and like go figure out. And like literally that's what it was. It was like figure out wallet management, figure out how to, you know, what's the best place to structure a fund? Is it in the US? Is it in the Sessions? Is it in... Yeah, there Malta, a big wherever, of, yeah. Yeah, a big exploration of getting things out of the U.S. at the time. So, so yeah, that's kind of how it started. It was just, I wanted to get into crypto. They didn't have, like, the budget or, the, you know, the funds to, like, you know, offer a comparable salary to, to Wall Street. Um, you know, so it was just, like, I was willing to take that risk and, you know, go do that $250 project that, you know, took me the weekend or, you know, we'll pay you five grand or we'll pay you, you know, three Bitcoin to go do that. And that's, you know, that was the benefit is, you know, th those two Bitcoins and three Bitcoins and five Bitcoins and 10 Bitcoins, you know, have all added up and, you know, now appreciated over the last five years. So it, it ended and is up that how you ended up um, getting, I mean, is that how you ended up with enough capital to start your own capital management firm? Was it really just early investment in crypto? Somewhat. So the, the, the transition from blockchain capital into starting my own fund was, was kind of just once again, being at the right place at the right time kind of early on. So I got involved in, in 2016 and 2017, like a big thing in crypto was, was ICOs or, you know, initial coin offerings. And they just popped up time and time again. And one of these projects was a company that I ended up working with called Gear, which is a green energy and renewables token. We brought on like a really great staff of people. We brought on really great advisors. We had like Larry King on board, Stan Barty, who runs a company called Forbes Manhattan, which is like a multi-billion dollar merchant bank in Canada. We had Jim Rogers, um, who's, you know, one of the legends in the traditional finance. So we had this kind of just like powerhouse of people. Long story short, got them involved in this project at like, you know, fractions of a penny. They all invested, you know, a million, two million, five million, ten million. It sounds like a lot of money, but for, for those types of people, it's, you know, nothing. It's us investing a dollar or whatever. Anyways, long story short, got, you know, I think in the span of like three or four weeks, it went from, I think, like three three cents to like $14 or something. Wow. Um, you know, they all came back and were like, Oh, I just made 20 or 30 or 50 or $60 million in like two months. Uh, wow. And you know, one thing rich people like is, is you know, getting richer. So yeah. they were like, how do I get involved? And, and that was kind of where it was back in 2016, you know, early 2017 was, do I bring them into one of these funds that I'm working with? 
do I, you know, do I kind of use that as leverage to then? Or do I just start it to, to, yeah, just start my own, right? I mean, just exactly. get something going. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. So, yeah. It's just, at, you know, at the right place at the right time. And, you know, they had every other asset class kind of checked off. They had someone managing, you know, the real estate investments. They had someone already managing traditional venture for them, but more on like non-crypto side. And that's yep. really how our fund got started was, was specifically in venture because they understood that model. And, and that's one of the calculated decisions that we made to not go into we're just going to invest into ICOs and liquid projects. Um, but yeah, so was at the right place at the right time with, you know, some really wealthy people who wanted to get an allocation into crypto. And once again, kind of figured that I would go out and, and branch off and see if I can make something happen. And if not, then I'd, you know, use my resume, my pedigree, my connections and go find, you know, someone else who'd, who'd pay me to, to go work for him. So yeah, so yeah that's kind of how it started. That's fantastic. And so how long has Hanum Capital been in existence? Yeah, we're, we're actually closing in on our four year anniversary, which is kind of wild to think about. So I, I think we got everything up and running. I think the, the first day that we actually accepted outside capital was, was I think, February 8th of 2017. And, you know, wow. we're closing on November of 2020 already. So, you know, right around the corner from, from four years. So it's been a, been a wild ride. That's crazy. So and um, how large have you grown the fund to be? Yeah, so the first the first capital that we raised was twenty five million uh, on our first fund, and that was from four LPs and then myself. So you know, one of the early questions of how did the fund start is investing a little bit of my own capital, and you know, was able to be early enough in crypto that that capital kind of expanded a little bit. But that was really how I was able to convince you know some of these guys that like take a chance on me. It's like I'm putting my own money at risk, and if I'm wrong, then I lose my money and I'm out. You know, I think that that allowed that skin in the game. Um, so yeah, so then was, I think Larry put in the first five and then, you know, the, the, the great thing about having Larry King involved is, you know, he's interviewed presidents, prime ministers, anyone who's done anything. Like I grew up as a kid, you know, my parents watched the Larry King show on yeah. CNN or whatever. So, so that was like the, the most amazing thing is getting Larry on board. And then Larry started opening up his Rolodex and, you know, he has a lot of uh, other friends who have a lot of money. And, you know, at the time crypto was like this, it, it still is, but like in 2017, it was like, it was everywhere on CNBC, on, on Wall Street Journal, everywhere. So, you know, luckily he had a lot of friends that were, you know, willing to give a, give a kid a chance and, you know, invest a little bit of money. And like I said, these are the type of people that have, you know, hundreds of millions. Some of our LPs are, you know, have billions of dollars. So investing two or $3 million is like, you know, nothing to them. They spend more on like, like fueling up their jets and their cars. Right. You know, so it sounds like a lot of money, but I'm um, so, yeah, you know, start off pretty small. And I think the, the, the great thing about us is since we've had, the four LPs in both of our funds, it's really allowed us to have a really great relationship with them. We, we had a five-year lockup in our first fund and seven year in our second fund. So it really allows me to kind of sit back and really calculate it of how we allocate. Um, and we've kind of seen like waves and trends, um, you know, of uh, you know, going through like traditional ICOs, which was like very anti VC. No one wanted VC money for like a year and a half because um, they all just wanted to go the ICO route. So it's allowed us to kind of sit back and really be able to kind of pick and choose the right teams, the right founders, the right models. And we've really focused more on like the, the picks and shovels and infrastructure of crypto. That's, you know, really allowed our community and ecosystem to expand. And that, that, was my, that was my next question is, you know, how do you, um, you said you're focused on infrastructure within crypto. How, how do you go ahead about like deciding what kind of subsection or what is, you know, your, your mandate really in terms of venture in something as, you know, new and bizarre as blockchain and crypto. Yeah. Um, so the good thing with our mandate is it, it's broad in the sense that it has to be crypto related. So if we invest in, like, we can't invest in like a fintech company per se that doesn't have a crypto element. So the good thing is like within crypto, you know, there, there's no set structure or set sector that we have to stick to, which I think has been great. And also, you know, back in 2015, 2016, there really weren't like sectors at the time. It was like, we were still kind of growing this stuff out. So, you know, if I, if I were raising a different fund now, I'm sure it'd be a little bit more focused, but for us, you know, we just saw that there was going to be a ton of value in crypto. And we really felt that like investing in the infrastructure of this ecosystem would allow additional, whether human capital, intellectual capital or real capital to flood into the space. And then, you know, we'd have kind of a rising tide lifts all boats type scenario, which is, you know, yeah. luckily worked out pretty well. So within crypto, we're not necessarily uh, picky on, on what we're looking at. We have, you know, investments in like tax software companies. We have investments in like mining companies. We have investments in like financial product companies, uh, financial uh, investments in like brokerages, like more of like exchanges. So really and like have, how do we get people in? What are they going to need? And then, you know, how do they make sure that they're compliant in the, in the organization? And have all of your investments been in tokens or are they in equity or are they like SAFTs? Like, you know, which, which stands for, of course, like the simple agreement for 
tokens and equity or equity, right? So how does that work? Do you guys do a token stuff? Because you're saying crypto. So it makes me think you've got a bunch of tokens in some cold wallet sitting somewhere. And that's like, you just check in on it sometimes to make sure nobody breaks into the office and steals it. Or is it more like you've also got, you know, actual, more traditional, like convertible notes, et cetera. Like, what have you got? Yeah, yeah. It's definitely more traditional. So, you know, as we touched on earlier, there's definitely been times within crypto where being traditional VC has been kind of looked at weirdly. And, and yeah, yeah. Back at the end of 2017, when everyone went the ICO route, no one wanted venture capital. That's true. But yeah, to answer your question, more on the traditional side. So on like the pre-seed or seed side, you're, you're looking at more of like a traditional convertible note on like the seed series A side, depending on, you know, the valuation, the traction, the company, what they're doing, then you get into more of like a priced equity round. And that's really our bread and butter. Um, we've now seen more structures, like you said, like, like the save. One thing that's popping up now is, is, is the, the CAF or CAFE. So there's like new kind of models and structures that you can invest from, invest from, excuse me. Um, but we've, we've tried to stay more on the traditional side. And, you know, as I mentioned, going back to how we were able to get the fund off and running, I felt more comfortable going to our investors and saying, here's the structure that we have. Like they may not know crypto, but they know how venture works and they know being, cause they're LPs and you know, other funds. So they know how that structure works. They know how decisions yeah. are made. They know where their money's going, et cetera. And it was a lot easier than being like, Hey, give me 5 million. I'm going to invest in ABC token. Like, right. I just don't feel comfortable doing that. I'm, you know, other companies and other funds have, and you know, they've been very successful at that, but, but yeah, for us, we've been more on the, the, the traditional venture side. And I think that's, you know, a differentiation that we need to make in crypto is, you know, VCs from like liquid fund or, or, or you know, hedge fund managers. So I think there's a different model and a different way of viewing the ecosystem uh, coming from, you know, allocating capital in, in, in different ways. That makes sense. Um, so you mostly are doing things pretty traditionally, just in, an untra- in a non-traditional space. Pretty much. We, we just saw that that was like a very workable model for our, our LPs. And we really felt that that's how like some of the companies in crypto would, would appreciate, you know, you look at like a Coinbase at the time who, you know, was raising capital at, you know, 10, 20, 30, $50 million valuation, they're now valued at eight or $9 billion. And that's like three or four years later. Right. And, you know, obviously that's a, you know, a massive example, but like we felt the same thing with a lot of these other companies, maybe not to that scale, but you know, companies that would allow people to be onboarded into the ecosystem. And then once they're in, you know, how do they interact? And then, right. you know, once they're interacting, you know, how do they either come out and be compliant or, you know, put their funds elsewhere. So that was really kind of like the model for us was, you know, how do we find companies that we think will onboard the next, you know, 100,000 or a million users. Um, and that's kind of been some of our philosophy in some of our investments more on like the adoption side. And then we have kind of like a compliance side of our portfolio as well. So with, um, well, first of all, I guess I have to ask because I'm sure plenty of people are listening that, um, well, not plenty, but there's always those entrepreneurs that are like, oh, wait, a venture capital company? Who's that? Uh, how can I get in touch with them? Are they, I mean, are you guys still actively deploying or are you now, you've deployed, you're done, you've locked up, you're good for seven years or five years and you're going to, you know, kind of, uh, I don't know, roll up the carpet for a while. Are you still taking in new opportunities? Yeah, we're still actively allocating. So we actually raised a second fund after we allocated the first fund. So the, once again, like the good thing for us is that we've had the same LPs on board for, for both funds, which allows that like, to, to roll a new fund is, is, you know, a pretty hard thing. And especially going off your first fund and especially in venture, because a lot of your investments haven't had the maturity to either be to go through M&A or go through IPO or have an acquisition. So you're yeah. kind of going and raising the second fund off like paper returns from the first fund. Um, so it's a little bit of an interesting structure, but to answer the question specifically, um, we're still allocating from fund two. We still have about, I think, 30 or 40 million that we're allocating from. Our typical check size is anywhere between 250K to 1.5. I think the largest check we've written is 2.2. And that was actually the latest stage as well. That was the only Series B investment we've made. But typically in that sweet spot of, of either pre-seed, seed, or Series A, anywhere between 250 to 1.5. So, you know, if you're out there listening and you, you have a, a passion for crypto or, you know, you're raising funds and already in crypto, you know, we'd love to take a look. That's great. That's awesome. I feel like that's, that's also sort of what your, um, what your motto has been, you know, like just jump in from the sidelines. Don't be afraid to, to get involved. And, you know, you don't have to be from the perfect background to do everything. You, you too can be expelled from a school or two and you can still <laughs> go out and do whatever you want. You know, it's pretty, pretty cool. much. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just think like, I think people allow themselves to be put in like nice, neat little boxes and, you know, our education system does that, you know, so it's not people's fault, but I think, through going through some of those hardships and experiences, it allowed me to realize that like the, the biggest thing in my life at the time that was holding me back was myself. And if I could get yeah. myself out of the way that like I could go do whatever I wanted to do. And I think that's something that I'm okay on my deathbed going to on my deathbed with, you know, 
ah, I kind of regret doing that, but I don't want to go and saying what if. And and that's exactly. kind of been my life motto is like, go, go chase it. Go, go, you know, go do it. I'm, I guess, in a position where I don't have a wife or kids um, or, you know, people, I guess, depending on me. So I can go, you know, like, like the transition to the West Coast, sell all my stuff, throw the dog in the car and drive out here. You know, I can go yeah. chase that dream. And like I said, you know, it may not be the, the Ivy League background, but I think I've had a strong enough pedigree strong enough resume and now strong enough connections over the last, you know, six or seven years of being out, out of school is um, to then go have that kind of safety net. Um, yeah. And then, you know, I guess the last thing, just like family, like my mom, you know, is always like, Hey, like, you know, if things don't work out, you got like, you know, there's a basement at home. Like, and that was the, the fear that I had is I never ever wanted to go back home and be in the basement. But like, that's something that was very supportive for me is having family and friends that were like, go, you know, go chase your dreams. We'll support you. You know, we'll obviously my mom wasn't very happy you know, at first when I was giving up, uh, you know, a nice cushiony, uh, you know, six figure finance job to go work in like magic internet money. Um, <laughs> magic kinda, internet money. We're going like, to call to go work in magic internet money. That's so true. Oh my God. Uh, she was not happy at all. What are you doing? You're throwing away your career, yada, yada, yada. But you know, yeah. luckily it's, it's worked out pretty well, but but You're yeah, like, well, you know, I got this deathbed theory. I got to work on it. I'm, I'm sorry, but I just can't keep doing this Goldman thing. It's just, I've seen, especially from where I'm from, which is like right outside DC, Northern Virginia, it's a very affluent area. It's very structured. You're supposed to go to school. You're supposed to become a doctor, a lawyer, or whatever. And like, there's nothing wrong with that. But like, I just, I, I wanted more out of my life and I wanted to go do things and try things and test things. And like, you know, like I said, I, I just, I'd rather have regrets than, than what ifs. And I think there's a lot of people out there that have gone like the safe and sound route and seen the job that they're not happy with, or, you know, especially in finance, I got a lot of people in finance that are making, you know, two, 300 grand a year, but are miserable. Like they yeah, hate going to work, definitely. they hate people they work with. So it's like, at what point does money or happiness become important to you? And, and for me, it was always that passion and crypto was that passion. And I knew if, if I followed my passion and used my experience and my ethic, like my work ethic, then I could go go build something. And, well, like, and if your passion just so happens to be all about money, then like, uh, it turns out you're probably going to be able to check both boxes by the end of that day, you know? <laughs> it worked out a little bit better than if I, you know, had a passion of being an artist or uh, a yeah. musician, you know, it's a, little, that's true. it's a little bit more lucrative, but, uh, but yeah, I guess that's the way I looked at it was, you know, had a great support team, had great people behind me and was willing to go take the risk and, and it's worked out. And, but I think that's the other thing is I had a plan if that didn't work, you know, yeah. to go back. To and a lot of support. Together. I mean, you had like a total bedrock behind you, which is great. I mean, people that can take a lot of huge risks when they know they've got a place to live. They're always going to have a roof over their head. They have supportive people that will not tell them they're a piece of shit. They're like, and this is like amazing stuff, right? And then also they like have the best pedigree that they could possibly really need to go back to a job they already know. And they already, I mean, it's like, yeah, it's, it's definitely like there was a couple of leaps in there. And then of course, once you have that, that foundation, you can really just, you know, go from anywhere. So that's fantastic to hear. Absolutely. And I guess the yeah. only thing I would add to that is just relationships. And I think that's something that I've you know, treated very carefully in my life. And I've seen people not do it in their lives. And I think that's, that was kind of that safety net is I've built great relationships at my last companies, at my last jobs, I left on the right, like in the right way and on the right term. So that's like the other thing It's like, go chase your dreams and go take those risks. But like, don't burn bridges along the way, like keep totally. good ties with people at your last organization, your last company. Cause like, we've already seen this before where we've had, we've invested in projects from employees at, at our portfolio companies who were like, you know, great employee but like i have this idea to go chase and they went and did it but like they yeah. did it the right so i guess that's the only thing is you know be very careful of you know how you treat people and i think that's the ultimate thing is i've now been able to assemble a great team behind me on the crypto side of people that you know act with integrity do things the right way and, and i think that that is what carries further than like the pedigree is just you know those relationships and those connections and that's something that has always been really important to me yeah, well, that's just like a great a great place to end, I think, is that, you know, take your risks and like go for it. But, uh, you know, make sure that you're taking care of everybody around you as much as you can as well. So thank you so much. This has been like, it's been very cool to hear your your approach and your path to getting to where you are with Hanum Capital, or sorry, Hanum Capital Management. It's not all just capital, but yeah, thank you so much for making the time for this. Um, do you have anything else you want to add? No, um, no, I, I think, you know, we covered it all, I guess, like the, the opportunity for today's, you know, call was really just to, you know, give people the the insight that, you know, you can go chase your dreams and, and, and go do things. And, you know, I don't want to be, you know, like the Gary V of like, you know, go <laughs> do stuff. like, but like, I, I guess my point was like, you know, I have a, a unique background that a lot of people haven't had and been able to use that background to get into to some, some interesting areas. So I guess that's my takeaways, you know, go chase your dreams, go, uh, 
go try to do some fun stuff. And, and if you're, you know, working in crypto, you know, give us a call. We'd love to, we'd love to work with you. Absolutely. Well, that's a, that's a great invitation to leave on. Thank you so much, Dan. It's been a total pleasure. And um, I guess this is, we're just going to sign off on the new trust economy and we will catch you on the next episode. Thanks so much for joining us, you guys. You've been listening to the new trust economy. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Visit us online at newtrusteconomy.com or on social at newtrusteconomy. Thanks for exploring the new trust economy with us.